Welcome to Right on Track, a songwriting podcast. Thanks to Tone for tuning in. I'm Demi Michelle Schwartz, and I'm thrilled you're joining me on my songwriting journey. So kick back and relax, don't fall flat, and remember, stay right on track. Welcome back to Right on Track. I'm so excited because joining me today is a very special guest. Please welcome Kent Blazy. How you guys doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm great. I'm glad to be here. Fantastic. I'm so honored you're joining me because we are going to be talking about all things songwriting. But before we get into our chat, can you share with the listeners a little about yourself and how you got started in music? Yeah, I got started um, thanks to a guy by the name of Roger McGuinn who played 12-string guitar for the Birds. And um, a lot of people I know got guitars because of the Beatles, but it was really the sound of that 12-string that made me go, hmm, I'd like to uh, be able to do something like that. And I kept looking at all the songwriters that were on that album, and there kept being this guy, B. Dylan. And I had no idea who that was. And I started doing some research and found out it was Bob Dylan, who's been a big influence on me and so many other people. And those two things kind of converged together and ended up uh, me thinking, hmm, maybe I can make a career out of this. And here I am. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. So when you started to explore songwriting, how did you go about developing your craft? Well, I had already been writing uh, poetry, I guess you would say, and some of them got um, put in a high school newspaper and uh, yearbook and stuff like that. So I thought, well, people seem to at least kind of like what I'm doing. So the minute I got a guitar, I started just putting my poetry to uh, some music, and that kind of evolved into songwriting. And Back then, there were so many great people that you could study in the 60s, so much great music being made that um, AM radio was and FM radio were basically my school, uh, my teachers. Um, on AM radio back to, at that time, you could hear Tammy Wynette and Roger Miller and the Four Tops and the Beatles and the Birds and Jimi Hendrix. You know, it was like... Uh, an amazing time to hear all kinds of music on one channel and we don't have that anymore but I think that was a big influence on me on what was popular in country and in pop and even you know you'd hear Frank Sinatra every once in a while and it was a great learning experience to see what people liked and what got played on the radio. That is fabulous. So you mentioned country music, which is a genre near and dear to your heart. So why do you gravitate to country? I loved uh, the main thing that got me in the country to begin with was there were so many great electric country guitar players. And I'm at the heart of me, an electric guitar player that loves playing electric guitar. And uh, so I was hearing these guys that were so fabulous and they played with people like Buck Owens and Merle Haggard. And so you can't help but listening to these songs that uh, the guys are playing guitar on. And so I became a huge Merle Haggard fan, Buck Owens fan. And about that time, uh, interestingly enough, the birds were going into country music. And so there was a convergence of country and rock. And Bob Dylan came to Nashville and recorded an album and Johnny Cash helped him. And that kind of knocked down the walls between what was country and what was rock. And that was a big influence on me too, because it was like, well, all these genres can work together. And that's kind of what got me into moving to Nashville and exploring that kind of music. That's awesome. I love how you brought that up because I think nowadays, especially genre blending is so huge. And as an independent artist myself, I love exploring different styles and pop and country and bringing other genre influences into my music. And I feel like we're at the point now where country has so many different sub genres that sometimes it's hard to categorize and people have different opinions on what country music is. Yeah, I mean, what I tell people when they ask me is I don't really even know what country music is these days. <laughs> uh, it's so many genres. And I think for the last five or six years when I've been doing my records, I'm probably more Americana than I am country. 
And part of it is because you can say different things that you maybe not be able to say on country radio. And there's a great uh, music critic here in Nashville, Tennessee, Robert Orman, who writes for Music Row magazine. And he uh, wrote a little article on me last year on a new record I did, and he called me Americana. And mm. so I've been saying, see, Robert Orman thinks I'm Americana. So <laughs> maybe I'm Americana. That's perfect. Wow. So you mentioned radio, and this is a perfect transition into another question I have for you. What are some things that you as a songwriter need to keep in mind while crafting a song that will potentially be a hit for country radio? Well, it's changed so much from what it was. You know, I uh, in the 90s, to me, there were so many great songs on the radio, you know, like the song Remembers When or Walk Away Joe or The Dance or Ships That Don't Come In. And it was just those heartfelt country songs that really told a good story, uh, had a great melody, had great singers. And, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that I still gravitate to. And uh, to me, that's what's missing in country radio these days. I call it the uh, pull over to the side of the road songs. And the last couple ones that I really can remember are The House That Built Me and I Drive His Truck, you know, and... I would like to see country get back to more of, uh, you know, the genre is widespread, but I think the uh, things that we're allowed to write about in country has shrunk. You know, you, you really don't want to be married or divorced or, you know, so many different criteria is put on it these days that it limits what you can say in a song. Yeah, it's really interesting because I've been very actively like researching and paying attention to the songs that are popular both in pop and country and you're completely right with like I feel like there is such a mainstream emphasis now in both the genres that labels one certain concepts and things are more narrowed with the lens of the styles and the songwriting and I think that that's taken a little bit away from the freedom of the songwriters who kind of have these genres at their heart that they want to tell these stories and be open and heartfelt and all those things. But I feel like some of that is lacking today. Yeah, a lot of times what I hear in a songwriting session, well, we can't we can't say that. We can't write about that. You know, that's uh, too old, um, that kind of thing. You know, we're aiming for a 12 to 32 demographic and we have to fit in there. And uh, so it's just kind of interesting. And, you know, the young people that I write with they're they're real good at knowing what's supposed to get on the radio or get listened to by publishers or uh, artists or whatever and um, so I listen to that but then I also think it's kind of sad that they can't expand more on what the possibilities are Mm -hmm. yeah for sure so because it is so narrow now with what is being written about for radio how do you go about do you have any tips on how to create songs that are fresh and new while also sticking into the norm well you know what has become a luxury for me is i'm at a place where i can pretty much write whatever i want to write (laughs) and put out my own records and they actually do pretty good and so i can write any kind of song that i want to write and a lot of the songs that i've been doing in the last four or five years i've been writing by myself because there's certain things that I want to say in songs that other people on Music Row don't really care about saying. And um, so that gives me a freedom that I didn't have maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago of trying to fit into the charts. And so I've kind of evolved into a different thing. And I like it because of the freedom. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. So you mentioned writing on your own which I do as well and collaborating with other songwriters so what is it like for you writing on your own versus things you have to keep in mind while in collaborations so when I write by myself I have a freedom to write whatever I want to write and maybe people don't want to hear it um, especially on you know music row or whatever but it still allows me that freedom to do whatever I want to do when I'm with another co-writer I'm trying to respect that they're trying to make a living and do it the way they're doing it. And so I'll listen to how they want to steer a songwriting session to be uh, maybe something that will be more music row or, or certain artists or something like that. And so I don't try to restrict them at all. I'll just go with where they want to flow and see what, what comes out of it. That's awesome. Yeah. 
So writing for artists is something you, you've done so, so much. And I want to specifically talk about Garth Brooks that I know you've written so much for. So can you share a little bit about how this friendship began and your experiences writing with him? Well, what happened was I had a demo studio. Uh, I kind of saw the writing on the wall back in the late 80s about where songwriting was going and where artists were going. So I started a demo studio partially to do my own demos, but also other people heard them and wanted me to do demos for them. So when you sing like me, you try to find the best singers that you can find, which in Nashville were called demo singers. And at the time, my stable of singers were like Faith Hill, Martina McBride, Randy Travis, Billy Dean, Joe Diffie. None of these people could get a record deal. And so they were singing demos for me. And it was just a magical time to hear all these amazing people that couldn't get a record deal. And so that's how I met Garth. He was cleaning churches and selling boots, and he thought he could make more money singing demos. So he came over to the house and brought uh, a demo that he'd done of six songs. I really liked what he was doing. And um, I said, I'll start using you on demos. And when he was leaving, he said, I write a little bit too. And so we set up a writing appointment and um, he came in and the first song that we ever wrote was If Tomorrow Never Comes when he was cleaning churches and selling boots and he had no record deal. And um, it was just, we knew we'd written a great song, but we couldn't get anybody interested in him or the song. We were going to rewrite the song uh, to try to make it better. And that week he got to play one song at the Bluebird Cafe here in Nashville. And he played If Tomorrow Never Comes and somebody from Capitol Records who passed on him for the third time that week uh, said, hey, we missed something, why don't you come back in? So he went in and got his record deal and If Tomorrow Never Comes was his second single and his first number one. And then the rocket ship took off after that. That is fantastic. Isn't it incredible how it really only takes one song? Yes. Some, there's, you know, I, I tell people all the time, Nashville's a place of magic and miracles, and you never know how they're going to show up. But, you know, just Garth being there that night, doing that song, if, what if he'd done another song, or what if he couldn't have played that night? It's You just never know. And um, it's so fun to be around some of these newer songwriter artists that are having that kind of, uh, experience too, or, you know, they've been struggling for five, six, seven years. And all of a sudden one song finds somebody and becomes a big hit. And that just thrills me to see it. The circle continuing, you know, of uh, the possibilities that this town can be. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Yeah. I feel like perseverance is so important. And if you love songwriting and you have a passion for it, just keep going and writing. I started writing for fun in 2017, started taking it more seriously in 2019. So I've really only been pursuing this for real for three years, which is not very long. Um, but I love it so much. And so I'm never going to stop doing that. Well, you know, I mean, that's what I tell all the young songwriters. If you can go do something else, go do something else. But if you just love writing songs, uh, that's what you got to do. You've got to have that perseverance, but you also have to aim to keep it fun. Mm -hmm. And that gets to be the hard part where business runs into creativity. And, uh, you know, it's like Dean Dillon said, this is 20 years ago, for every 600 songs I write, I get six songs cut. And that's Dean Dillon. So it just shows you the odds of what, what you're up against writing songs. But the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. The more you love it, the better you're going to get at it. The more fun you have, the better you're going to get at it. That's my take on everything. That's perfect, yeah. So let's talk briefly about the business side of things. So the music industry has changed tremendously from when you started to where it is now. So can you just talk a little about how the reality was when you started to make it in songwriting and the reality of songwriting in today's world. Yeah, it was interesting. When I started out, like when I came to Nashville, it was coming off of the urban cowboy thing. And back then, if you had a song on a record or something, most records were selling less than 100,000, even if it was people having number one records. And um, so... 
if you didn't have a hit single every once in a while, it was really hard to make a living. So at that time I was doing this demo work I was talking about. I was playing on other people's sessions. I was playing in a band at night, just doing anything I could to, to stay alive. And then all of a sudden you had Randy Travis come out, took things way back to country music. Alabama was selling millions of records. Then Garth came along and started selling outrageous numbers and a lot of people did during the 90s well back then mechanicals which is the sale of a record itself could be pretty good if you were on a record that sold a million two million 20 million like garth um what happened was in 2014-15 when they started getting rid of cds that's when mechanicals disappeared and so all of a sudden it all went to streaming, it went to downloading, which paid maybe one tenth or one one hundredth of what uh, mechanicals paid on records. So that totally changed the field of being able to afford having a, a songwriter that you could hire and um, and pay them a salary because the money was coming in from mechanicals and it was no longer there. So it totally changed the whole way that songwriting had to be done that's why they came up with these 360 deals where the record labels or the publishing company own everything that artist does till they recoup and um you know with spotify and stuff the guy who wrote all about the bass with megan trainer that was you know it got like 450 million spotify hits i think he made four thousand dollars oh wow like that. that's crazy so, that's crazy and um i had a song that was um a single on a girl on rca and it was about a father dying this was probably 2008 or 9 and um it went to maybe 13 on the charts but all they did a video and all of a sudden one day i found out she'd had 12 million hits on her video on youtube and i thought 12 million i, I you know i've never had 12 million of anything <laughs> and I went and asked my administrator what I was going to make off of it. And she said, oh, maybe $300. <gasps> oh, my gosh. That's nuts. That is nuts. And that's when I realized we're not getting paid anything for what we uh, are creating these days. And it's 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 fairly sad that if you're not having a, a single on a radio, um, you know, I know songwriters that were big songwriters that are either leaving town or they're driving Ubers or they're working at Home Depot. And it's just a, a different world than it was even 10 years ago. No, that's absolutely nuts. And I think the sad thing is like the songwriters are the ones behind everything. Yes, artists are incredible, but they wouldn't have these songs if it wasn't for the songwriters. So it's really sad seeing how we're just not getting respected. Yeah, that's where those people like the Spotify people or whoever, they don't really care that we're not getting paid. You know, we don't, they don't care that sooner or later may not be any songwriters because of uh, the amount of money that people have to live on. And, um, you know, they can pay Joe Rogan $200 million a year on his Spotify show, but they can't pay songwriters what they owe them from four years ago. So it's very frustrating how they perceive what we do. And then, you know, the other problem is they have $50 million to have people on Capitol Hill lobbying for them. And I think as Nashville Songwriters Association has 1.5 million. Uh, it's hard to compete with that, but we keep chipping away at it and uh, we're not going to stop till we get back to where we were, where we can at least make a living at what we're doing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's crazy. So it can be very discouraging looking at the business side. But as far as the craft goes, do you have any advice for songwriters for maybe if they're just starting out or aspiring to do this? Any advice for them? <laughs> The first thing that I tell anybody and the first thing that I did when I came to Nashville is join the Nashville Songwriters Association. And this doesn't matter where you are because there's uh, they're all over the country. They're actually all over the world. They have uh, different sponsors and stuff. And you can join. You can go to meetings in your hometown or you can go online and watch them in Nashville. They'll critique your songs which is what everybody needs these days is the feedback 
And if they hear something they like, they'll pass it on to publishers, they'll pass it on to uh, record labels. And that's the most valuable thing to me is the service that they offer to songwriters. They can put you with co-writers, say you're a better lyricist than you are a guitar player or vice versa. They can put you together with somebody. And, um, you know, I don't know anybody else that's offering that kind of thing that really is a good place for any songwriter from the very newest one till the oldest one of what they offer to everybody. What do you see the biggest mistake songwriters make? Uh, I think the biggest mistakes that songwriters made, and I'm one of them, is <laughs> uh, the fir- that you think the first songs that you write are great. <laughs> and um, sometimes you'll you'll be so enthusiastic that you'll pitch things to maybe big artists or publishers or something before you're really ready. And so the next time you go back, maybe they don't want to meet with you because you didn't really impress them. And it's just the kind of thing of having the best possible thing you can do uh, anytime you're able to meet with somebody. And that means if you got to get 10 opinions from different people about what you're doing, just be prepared and, and be the best that you can be when you get that big meeting that could change your life. Yeah, no, that's great. So aside from seeking out feedback, what is some of the criteria you look for in songs that makes you realize that they're great ones? You know, I think it's still a combination of when you can hear the lyrics and the music that seem like they're wedded perfectly. And, um, you know, it could be the the pop song, it could be the rap song, uh, it could be a country song, bluegrass song. But when you hear those songs that really make you appreciate how the music and the lyrics go together and how they embellish each other, that's when you know you've really got a great song. That's awesome. I love that so much. Yeah, it's all about prosody. You know, it's uh, it's something that I'm always listening for on any kind of radio station when I'm going flipping through the channels, you know, and I end up on Americana most of the time because those people really get to say a lot more than probably any other genre. It probably sells less than any other genre, but at least there's that uh, freedom to have so many different people expressing how they feel about things. For sure. Absolutely. So whether writing on your own or in a collaboration, do you have a songwriting process that's pretty consistent from song to song, or does it typically change? The main thing that I like to do is um, work from a title. Um, Some songwriters don't really care to do that. They just want to see what happens when you're in the room. But I, uh, from uh, first, when I started writing songs, I kept little notebooks full of ideas, full of titles, full of lines that I could maybe use. Uh, When the little notebooks would get full, I'd transfer them to a big notebook uh, for every given year that I was uh, doing this. And then when I would get into a writing session, I would have pages and pages of ideas to share with somebody. And I found that that's as important as anything else because a lot of people come in and they don't have any ideas Uh, on the day you're wanting to write. And to me, the best collaboration is when you come in with some ideas and another songwriter comes in with some ideas. And between the two of you, you hopefully have a song at the end of the day, thanks to both people putting their brains together and coming up with something that they both like. That's fantastic. I love how you start with titles, typically. I've actually started doing that because I feel like If you're writing from a concept, that's always great, but sometimes you can end up writing something that you've heard before or that's not very original. But I think, like, I've been very mindful of just, like, being out in public when when I'm reading books, too, watching TV. Like, if somebody says something, then I'm like, oh, that's a really cool thing. That could be a song title that I've never heard before. Like, I definitely write it down and explore it because I can go down different avenues. That you're doing the right thing. I mean, Kim Williams, a great songwriter, used to call it fishing for hooks. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he would just read a bunch of books or he would watch a bunch of movies. Uh, he'd go to the library and just walk around looking at the titles yeah. that were on books. And uh, so he always had song ideas. And, um, you know, it made it such a joy to work with him because he had, like me, pages and pages of ideas that, He'd been mining, as he called it, you know. Uh, He would spend days doing that. And um, that just showed how prepared he was um, 
any time that you went into a writing session with him. And that's professional to me. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. 100%. Yeah, like even if you don't end up working on one of your own ideas in a collaboration, I personally think just showing up with some ideas is the right thing to do. Yeah, I think it shows respect for the other songwriter. You know, a lot of times I'll get, and this is especially young songwriters uh, for whatever that's worth, but they'll come in and they'll go like, well, I don't have any ideas today. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, I do. Uh, you know, and, and it just shows to me a lack of, you know, I'm getting with another songwriter. I want to be prepared. I want to have something I can show them. And that doesn't mean... It may be the idea that you write, but it may make them think of something or go, well, you know, what if we did this? And then there's some songwriters that I work with that um, uh, one, and especially Corey Batten, who's a great songwriter, but he's an only child. So he's going to write what he wants to write. <laughs> and so, you know, I used to fight it at first and now I'm just like, hey, you tell me what you want to do and we'll make it happen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it works really good that way and uh and i'm fine with that because he always comes in with ideas yeah and uh, and always sound better that's to him <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic oh my gosh well from time to time we all face writer's block so do you have any tips for overcoming this you know i, I don't believe in writer's block <laughs> and i believe if you don't believe in it you can't believe that you can believe that it happens. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I th you know, I really think that if you're looking for ideas all the time and you're keeping notebooks and you're watching movies and reading books or whatever, I, I don't think you're going to come up with um, a writer's block because uh, you've always got uh, books you can go back through and look, uh, you know, if you have books from every year and you're kind of stuck and nothing's in the book you like, go to another book or go yeah. Uh, you know, read another book, or watch another movie, and just something's going to come to you. And the other thing is, if you if you feel like a writer's block's coming on, go listen to other music that uh, people are doing and see what inspires you. You know, whether it's something from the '60s or something that just came out last week. You know, uh, it's just that thing that whatever lights your fire and keeps your fire going, and it's it's that thing of just always being open to what's going to show up with a song title or something. Like you said, something jumps off the movie of, Hey, that'd be a great song idea. And so you're, you're doing the right thing, what you're doing. And I think if, if everybody did that, that writer's block would not be as prevalent as people think it is. For sure. Awesome. Well, I have one more question for you. And this is, what is one final thing you would like to share about the life of a professional songwriter? Well, you know, um, if you can make a living as a professional songwriter, it's as good of a life as anybody could expect. You know, you're getting to do something you love. You're getting to be creative. Um, you're getting uh, acknowledgement of the time and effort that you put in to be a professional songwriter. And, um, you know, I would love for everybody who chooses to be a songwriter to be able to experience that because it's it's the greatest feeling there is of wow i'm making a living doing something that i love and um you know that's where the joy comes in that's absolutely incredible kent it was a lovely having you can you share with the listeners where they can find you online and check out your work yeah i uh, you can go to cdbaby.com they have uh hard copy and they have downloads they you can go to spotify itunes all those people that i rant and rave about uh amazon and also kentblazy.com you know if you would like something signed by me or whatever um just uh, send me an email there and it'll get to me and i can do that so um i thank you for having me on and for the great questions and let's make more of course. It was lovely having you. Such an honor. Listeners, thank you for listening to this episode with Kent Blazy. And of course, until next time, stay, stay right, right on, on track. track.